Hello, everyone. My name is Carmela Troncoso. I'm going to present today my experience engineering privacy in content tracing apps and how hard it was to make it real. This journey started as a sprint back in March 2020 towards the first deployment of these apps. By July 2020, this had become a marathon in which we continued working on the maintenance. And by now, it is an Iron Man in which not only continue maintaining these apps, but also working on new technology that can help with pandemic mitigation. Why did we start working on these apps? Back in March 2020, when the number of cases increased, manual contact tracing collapsed. What's manual contact tracing? Is this key tool to help break in chains of infections. It works by interviewing infected users, asking them for the close contacts, and then calling these close contacts to ask them to take precautions and not continue spreading the virus. As the number of cases increased, this became just not possible. There was not enough people to make these interviews and calls. So the idea was, can we have some technology that help us complement the manual process and help notifying people in a faster way, in a more efficient way, that means with less human labor, and in a scalable way, as the pandemic is not in one town or one country, but all around the world. And of course, when I say we need technology to notify people that have been close to others, a lot of security and privacy ring bells, like, can we do this thing? And indeed, from the beginning, we were extremely worried about the fact that these apps could be misused. They could be used for surveillance, they could be used to manipulate population, to target individuals, and other bad things. So my group was very focused from the beginning on creating something whose purpose was limited by technology to only be able to do this notification. And soon after we discovered that our fears were well founded, as we saw how data collected for contact tracing, whether in the apps or in manual form, for instance, at restaurants, was being used by staff or by the police for all other users than the one that was initially collected for. Information is, for instance, identity, the location of the users that reveals a lot about their identity and their preferences or behavior. Who do they meet? When do they meet these people? For how long? How frequently? So this is the kind of information we wanted to hide. And of course, we also needed that these applications were secure. That means that when you receive a notification, it is real. Otherwise, users do not trust the application and that it is hard to do a denial of service attack because it serves for nothing to have an app in the pockets of millions of users if the servers uh, just don't work. And there was another constraint that we see, didn't see in the beginning, and we don't often see in academia. It's called reality. And the first thing is that this app that we were building, as I said, it had to be very scalable, but it also had to be very reliable because we are trusting it to help us get out of this pandemic. But the thing that most um, influenced the design was the time pressure. We had to design it very fast. The pandemic was here. And that means that we needed to design something very simple that we could very fast verify not only the design, but also the implementation so that any property that we thought the protocol would have, we could verify that it was for real and we could ensure the users that they were getting what we were promising. This also meant that we could not use any fancy technology or any technology that did not exist. And we had to rely on existing sensors, namely the phone and on the sensors of the phone. And in this case, the decision was to use Bluetooth low energy. And all of these created a lot of dependencies from existing infrastructure that, as we will see in this talk, had a lot of impact on the privacy properties and the privacy engineering of the system. So with these constraints, we started working. And we had a first idea that I would tell you about, but actually this never got implemented because the constraint of reality and the fact that we needed to rely on existing infrastructure meant that we had to work on phones where the operative system is not under our control. The operative system is built by Google and Apple. So they had to be involved. They had to be involved to ensure that the usage of Bluetooth did not consume too much battery. Otherwise, the users could not um, use the applications. Apple needed to be involved to ensure that the app could read Bluetooth beacons in the, in the background, something that was not possible before because of privacy reasons. 
And they also needed to collaborate to make sure that the beacons on iOS and Android would actually be compatible. We saw in our first experiments where they were still not in this game that many times this was not true. And when they were there, they also decided that it would be the ones that implement the protocol and they decided it was the API that was exposed to the apps to gain information. And this, as we will see in this talk, had heavy influence on the privacy engineering um, that we did. And I don't have time to talk about it today, but it also had strong impact on what is the epidemiological use that we can do of the app and how can we compute uh, exposure to race alarms and also had impact on the privacy of other parts, like for instance, when you put together apps from two countries. So how they implemented the protocol, very similarly to our first design, is that phones generate a secret key every day called the temporary exposure key. And from this key, it derives random identifiers that is broadcast in Bluetooth beacons. These identifiers have a limited lifespan so that they cannot become pseudo identifiers and you can track people with them. And if you don't have the key, these, um, these identifiers are cryptographically unlinkable. So once phones can broadcast, they broadcast numbers of the time. And when users come close to each other and they hear the other um, identifier, they store it together with some information about the power of the signal that is used later on to as a proxy for distance in the computation of exposure. So here A can see B and notes their identifier. B can see A and C, so notes both identifiers. And C is close enough to B, but not to A, so only notes down the identifier of B. When one of the users is sadly um, COVID positive, they will receive an access code from the doctor and with this access code they can upload the keys that their phone generated during the infectious period to a server. Periodically all of the users download keys from this server and then they derive uh, random identifiers that were created and compare them to the list of sys numbers. If some of these numbers actually coincide so they have been close to people that were COVID positive, they will take all of these power measurements that they said before and make a joint computation. If the joint computation establishes that they were very close to these people for long enough time, it will raise a notification for the user. In the case of Switzerland, this notification, for instance, tells the user to please self-isolate and then call to an info line for further instructions. So in this protocol, the only information that ever leaves the phone are the temporary exposure keys. These keys are not associated to the identity of the users. They are generated the random by the phone. They are not associated to the location. They are created at a predefined um, schedule. And they don't have information about others because regardless of how many people you have met and how often, you will always upload the same number of keys, the ones that you produced. As a result, there is no information outside of the phones available for abuse. As an additional nice feature, the system senses by design. What does this mean? Is that if after the pandemic, countries decide that the system should be still be existent, users themselves can ensure that the system dies by stopping uploading keys to the server, and therefore there is no more information flow. The information in the server is not useful, and the system is basically dead. In the rest of the talk, I would focus here on the left part of the, of the graph, which is where we have to do more privacy engineering to ensure that the privacy of the protocol was lifted uh, throughout the system. And this is because the protocol is a very small part. The protocol is embedded on a mobile system, as we just said, that is embedded on an app, then is then embedded on a bigger health system. And all of it has a lot of constraints, legal, societal, and epidemiological. And it turns out that in many of these places, you will actually find quicksand and some parts of the design will not work. And as we will see, we have to change them. One of them is authorization. I said that in order to upload codes, uh, the user needs an authorization code. That is to avoid that false, um, to avoid false matches if people just upload keys of people that are not positive. Of course, the authentication mechanism 
has to pre preserve the privacy of the system and it has to be hard to delegate. That means that I cannot give it to other users so that they upload their keys. In that case, again, we could have false alarms that could uh, make people not trust the system. We know how to do this from a crypto perspective. We could, for instance, commit to the keys that I'm going to upload, such that the access code is tied to my phone. Now, this is great, but on the one hand, we cannot do this thing because the protocol and the API that Google and Apple produce make this hard. But more importantly, health systems and the staff in these health systems not always have the digital tools that we would need to do this. So at the end, we had to go for um, a very simple activation code that was sent in via phone or by uh, snail mail or SMS. And some countries have different level of automatization in how the code is created and sent. And as far as I know, only Belgium goes for a little bit more of a fancy protection. Okay, so we have an authentication mechanism, maybe simple, but it is there. Are we done from a privacy perspective? If you think about how I explained the system, the only time good users make uploads is when they are COVID positive. That means that the very existence of the upload would actually reveal one of the most sensitive information in the system, the health status of users. So, okay, we know how to solve this. In practice, it was very good. We wrote it in the first white paper. This can be mitigated using dummy uploads. Little did we know that in reality, this is a bit more difficult. The first pitfall is that when we think about this in academia, you always know how the system works because you decide how systems uh, users behave. In reality, we didn't know anything about the environment and what the user behavior is, especially with a new application deployed in a new situation that never had happened before. Also, we had to rely on a platform that had their own constraints, like bandwidth. Not only we could not consume all of the data plan of the users, but also we could not put a high low on the network, which is actually an actual service provider that could be upset if we just consume too much traffic. We also need to make sure that we don't take down the server by making too many petitions because of dummy traffic. This costs money and also it is hard when the load is too high. And of course, we need every time you send traffic, you consume battery on the phone and we need to be very economical with this because we know that if the app consumes too much battery, users directly uninstall it. Also, because we cannot use uh, infrastructure that is not mainstream, anonymity networks were out of the questions and delays are not possible. Remember, we want a timely application. We want to be faster than manual contact tracing. So we cannot go around just waiting to upload things to the servers to have more privacy. As a result, we had to settle for a week privacy property plus the deniability that we build by ensuring that these uploads are like um, in constant time and size with respect to real uploads. And you can read more about the details of our protocols and decisions in the document that is at the bottom of the slide. And okay, this is cool. But as I said before, there is authentication. That means that the graph is not as simple as this. Because to get this authentication code, what actually happens is something a bit more complicated. When I get the authentication code, this is generated by a second server that we have to create in reality that didn't exist in the white paper. And then the user would send this access code to the server that would return a sign token that is what you use to actually do the upload. This means that the dummies must also realize this authentication step to be indistinguishable. This means that now two servers have to be um, aware that there are dummies and have processes to deal with them. And on both of them have to ensure that there is equal processing time and traffic volume, regardless of this being a dummy or a real upload. To make things more complicated, in the early versions of Google and Apple, before version 1.5, there was one security mechanism to avoid replay attacks. It was that the key would only be provided to the application after it expires. This is great. And I must to say that um, it is not really necessary. This was an implementation option to simplify. And when it simplifies that part, it makes has many others. So one of them is that if now a key comes later, you have two options, delay all keys or send the key on the next day. Of course, we cannot delay. And to send the key of the next day, it means that the authorization needs an extra step. 
how we solved this. It was a very dirty hack in which we had the application, uh, sorry, the server giving us a second token that we would use to upload the last key on the day after. Now that means the dummies also must do this extra upload. But when dummies happen, all of this happens in the background. And it turns out that when you work on a platform like a mobile app application, you have no guarantee that your app will always wake up and do whatever it has to do. Again, battery, battery optimizations by the uh, phone manufacturers. And now we had to deal with the fact that many times the phone does not do exactly what we would. So our computations had to take this into account. Again, I encourage you to read uh, our design paper to learn more about this. And the so final thing that we had to do to ensure that privacy was really end to end is to take into account that servers don't exist in a vacuum. Servers don't exist in a very pretty white slide that, like, that the one I have here. They actually live on a cloud that looks something more like this. For a mapping, on the very left, we have uh, the doctor at the top of the phone and then uh, the two servers that we were using. And this yellow layer that you see in the middle, that's actually the typical cloud infrastructure that is necessary for security and operative purposes. Load balancer, a firewall, and it turns out that those off the shelf tool do a lot of logging that we didn't think about when we were designing the system. And that meant that we had to redesign what kind of information is logged by our servers to make sure that there was no uh, forensic analysis possible. The same held for any type of statistics that we would collect to monitor the working of the app. We needed to make sure that when correlated with information that is um, off the shelf tools could collect, which by the way, we have no control on and we cannot change, would not break the privacy of the users. We had to redesign the login strategy a bunch of times to ensure that privacy was always conserved. These apps by now are in many countries around the world. The ones in green here use our code base and therefore have the extra protections I have talked about in this talk. And in Switzerland, we have around 1.9 million active users, which is 22% of the population. We run a study back in October with a user surveys, and we discovered that users are pretty compliant. The 80% of them upload codes, and 22% are sent to quarantine out of which one of 10 test positive after they receive an app notification. Most importantly, the app notification is actually faster one day before than the notification that users would receive via the phone, avoiding a lot of contagion. So what are the key lessons to take away from uh, all of this experience? First of all, data is not a must. We can build extremely nice applications without a piece of data. Second is the privacy engineering goes well beyond crypto. Doing the crypto and the protocol is just the starting point. And when you have to do this privacy engineering in an agile world where requirements change and when you depend on services and which you don't have control, this is exhausting. You have to change all the time your designs to account for reality constraints. And finally, the technology can be perfect, but if you don't have good social integration, then there is no way that it succeeds. This is what happens with these apps, where a lot of problems stem from the fact that the non-digitalized health service cannot really give good support to the technology that the app has. And this is why it is very important that from the beginning, we're gonna deploy something that we cannot test beforehand. Like it was in these apps, there was no time. Purpose limitation is done from the beginning. So please, if you're gonna deploy any new technology, take this into account and respect your users. Thank you very much.